So good evening, everyone. My name is Brian Schmisek. I'm the provost at the University of St. Mary the Lake. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce our president rector, Father John Karchi, who will officially welcome you to tonight's event. Father Karchi. Very much, Brian. Uh, well, welcome. It's wonderful to see a number of new faces here, but also some old friends. We don't get together as a wider public nearly as often as we should. Uh, but uh, Brian will come back and introduce uh, our speaker tonight. But just to say a word about the Pollock Lecture Series, uh, Mundelein uh, USML has really been blessed to be able to have Pollock scholars and uh, guest lectures really for many years now since 1990 is when the lecture series was first initiated. Uh, Mary Lou Pollock herself is here and she and her family have just blessed and graced this campus in so many ways uh, over the decades. But just to say a word about the lecture series, really the idea is certainly promoting theological studies uh, here at the university, but always with an eye towards, again, the wider public. So it's sort of a, a a parallel but with a little bit different focus to the Meyer Lecture Series that we host a little bit later in the year. And it's just an opportunity to bring scholars to campus uh, from various areas, certainly theology, but also church history, uh, and try to sneak a few biblical scholars in every now and then. Uh, Dr. Dealey and others are here, uh, very well grounded in that field. But it's worth noting that uh, the very first uh, lecture was uh, Father Leverdier. Jean Laverdier, a very noted scripture scholar. Uh, we've also been blessed to have here Ewart Cousins, uh, Ed Oaks, who was on the faculty for a number of years, Father Joe Henchy, Sister Sarah Butler, uh, Father David Fagerberg, who just retired, I learned, from Notre Dame, uh, Reinhard Huter, and Monsignor Paul McPartland. So a wide range of scholars and men and women who love and serve the church. And I think that's very much in line with the mission that we have here of really trying to produce uh, priests and lay men and women ministers in the church just to be certainly good shepherds, but also good teachers. Uh, and so tonight, as you'll find, and Brian will give a, a more formal introduction, I think we're in for a real treat. Um, uh, Massimo, Dr. Massimo Fagioli uh, has written extensively on the Second Vatican Council and just on the church in general, particularly in, uh, in recent years. So that's obviously very germane to our mission here uh, and just so grateful to have him. But to tell you more about our speaker is our provost, Brian Schmizek. Thank you. Thank you, Father John. And before I introduce our speaker, I do want to acknowledge the presence of Mary Lou Rafferty Pollock. Can you please stand up, Mary Lou? <laughs> Daughter of Margaret and Chester Pollock, who established this chair more than three decades ago. The Pollock Lecture, as Father John was saying, is a celebration of theological inquiry designed to explore the vast and intricate realms of Catholic theology. Each year we hear from distinguished scholars, theologians, or experts who share their insights, research, and reflections on the dynamic and ever-evolving landscape of theology. The generosity and foresight of the Pollocks has positively impacted all of us, and especially so this evening when we're pri privileged to welcome Dr. Massimo Fagioli to campus as our 2024 Pollock Lecturer. Born in Italy, Massimo Fagioli is a full professor in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at Villanova in Philadelphia. As a church historian and prolific writer, he contributes to Commonweal. He's a columnist for LaCroix International, not to mention his many significant works in English and Italian, and his seminal works on Vatican II, including his 2012 work, Vatican II, The Battle for Meaning, and even more recently, the Oxford Handbook on Vatican II, published last year. 
The last time he was on campus was 2007, and so we're delighted to welcome him back this evening. Dr. Fajoli. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. It's a great honor. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this lecture at the University of St. Mary of the Lake and the Mandalay Seminary. As I said before, I see myself a little bit as a Chicago Catholic because this is where I basically met not just my wife, but also US Catholicism in those years. Um, and so it's a great pleasure to be um, here. The title of this lecture is What Remains of Vatican II, Catholic Crisis and the Meaning of the Catholic Tradition. The relationship with the past is central in our Catholic tradition and in Christianity. But what past? If we look at the recent history, we have seen in these last few years the news cycle dominated by the, the abuse crisis, financial scandals, intra-ecclesial polarization. These events say something about our times and about our sense of the past and of the, of the tradition, included the Second Vatican Council. So here Vatican II has been, I believe, absorbed in these last few years by a series of new issues that have put a different light on the meaning and the message of, of, of the Second Vatican Council. The first of these new issue of, of these new issues is the relations in history between Christianity and the discourse on race and colonialism. The 21st century is a key moment in the rise of the consciousness of the church under pressure from outside cultural forces, but not only for its role in the history of our civilization in a much delayed metanoia, a conversion some two decades after John Paul II's call for the preparation of the Great Jubilee of 2000 in his Tertium Millennio Adveniente. This happens at a time when there is a massive process of narrowing and shrinking of the world of white men in global Catholicism. This new sensibility to the role of the race issue and of racism in the church must be linked to a new attention to the participation to and the reception of Vatican II in the post-colonial world. And this shift in, in, involves all the hermeneutics of the tradition beginning with a decolonization of the biblical narratives of the fathers of the church, of liturgy, and of church teaching in general. Simply put, Vatican II now is read through a post-colonial or decolonial lens in ways that were not practiced just 10 years ago. Second issue, there's the issue of uh, women and gender in the, in, the, in the church. Famously, halfway through the Second Vatican Council, Cardinal Sunez of Mechelen in Belgium asked his fellow bishops, quote, why are we even discussing the reality of the church when half of the church is not even represented here, end quote. Following this provocative statement, in October 1963, 23 women were invited to attend select sessions at the Second Vatican Council as auditors. Since then, much has changed in the church, and it suffices to take a look at the list of the voting members in the assembly of the Synod on the synodality. But even today, there's still an asymmetry between the lived Vatican II Catholicism and the scholarship of women and of the Global South scholars, women and not women, on the history and theology of the Second Vatican Council. In other words, the Council has been studied and continued to be studied more by white men than by women and Catholic scholars from the Global South. Unfortunately, in the eyes of many feminist scholars, Vatican II is irrelevant because it has little or nothing to say to women or, or about women. In the eyes of many Catholic scholars from the Global South, 
on the other side, any international project on Vatican II still carry a colonial DNA. Third issue, the, church, the church's past, Vatican II included, is read now through the lens of the abuse crisis in the Catholic Church. After passing through the crucible of, the, of this crisis for almost four decades, one might develop a far-reaching hermeneutic of suspicion which can turn dark on the meaning of the, of the tradition and of Vatican II, but which can also shed some light. And this raises important methodological questions for church history as a whole. The abuse crisis has changed our perception of the church and of reform in the church in a way that is different from, for example, Yves Congar's idea of church reform in 1950, but also at Vatican II and in the early post-Vatican II period. At the same time, <clears throat> the historiography of Vatican II must be aware that demonizing our collective past may leave us unrooted in the present. The focus on the abuse crisis as the only interpretive lens on what the church is, is fully part, I think, of the so-called presentism, our modern habit of weighing the past against the social concerns and moral categories of our present. So these three issues are just the tip of the iceberg with which I think the bark of Peter, all of us, and our sense of the tradition are sometimes apparently on a collision course. These three issues are part of what Pope Francis described, referring not just to these three issues, but more generally to the relations between the church and the world of today as, quote, not an era of change, but a change of era, end quote. So these three issues are part of profound movements involving Catholicism today. The new global dimension of the church away from one single historical, cultural, and theological paradigm. The th uh, theological and cultural rifts within European, Mediterranean, Western space, and the shrinking of, the, of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the European Catholic matrix. The rise of a post or anti-institutional mindset in ways that are very different from the institution the post-institutional mindset of the 1970s, and then the digital world, social media, the marketization of cultural identities. In all this, I think, the well-known clashes on the hermeneutics of Vatican II between liberal progressives and traditionalists or conservatives between continuity and reform versus con discontinuity and rupture, I think are more like tidal waves than that tsunami waves following the deep and massive movement of tectonic plates crashing into each other in the depth of the church's consciousness. We are no longer in the Pangea-like Catholic Church of the early centuries and late antiquities of medieval Christendom, and we're no longer in early modernity or even in the 20th century. What does this mean for the church that is still receiving Vatican II? For a church that is, has no council like a Vatican III in sight, and for which synodality might be replacing conciliarity at all, or might be a new form of conciliarity. These new issues that I mentioned at the beginning for the church have direct consequences on those who work for the church and contribute professionally to its thinking, in particular way as members of academic institutions, but also for all those who teach and preach and work in the church. The function of the mission of Catholic leaders until Vatican II and a few years later used to be to feed the members of the church, the pietas that uh, love towards the church as a mother, as an institution, and as a community. 
the studies on Vatican II and the Catholic tradition were part until not long ago when I was a doctoral student. They were part of the history of institutions, of popes and bishops, history of dogma and of heresies. Now we are in a completely different picture. It's not just the old-fashioned historia ecclesiastica that is gone. It's at Vatican II, with its theology, its main protagonists, uh, the event, is objectively called into question in what kind of role it played in the genesis of this crisis. And the scholars on Vatican II are involved in this quest. I think we are here before, I mean, we have before us a new challenge, a new sense of the academic mission of theology and of the, of, of the vocation, of all those who work in the church and for the church. These cataclysmic events have appended the horizon, not just of, of academics, of public intellectuals and church leaders. It involves, in different ways, the entire church, including those who have left the church permanently or temporarily or, or have taken some distance from the institutional church. It involves all those who deal with the church and its public and visible presence in schools, hospitals, social work, and in its participation in the important cultural and social debates of our time. <clears throat> Henri de Lubac famously said that, quote, Christianity is not one of the great things of history. History is one of the great things of Christianity, end, end quote. This is still true. But the poly crisis, this crisis, affect the church and compel us to deal with what has been called by a French historian, Francois Artaud, a new regime of historicity in the Catholic Church, or a crisis in the existing regime of historicity. That is, a different kind of concept or relationship with the past, the present, and the future. This, I think, one of the least acknowledged ruptures between Vatican II and today, and with earlier stages in the debate on the Second Vatican Council. This goes back to the very opening of the Second Vatican Council. Pope John XXIII, when he opened Vatican II with his uh, surprising and agenda-resetting speech of October the 11th, 1962, Gaudet Mater Ecclesia, <clears throat> In the most crucial passage, when he took critical distance from the prophets of doom, he also said this, quote, these prophets of doom, they keep repeating that our times, if compared to past centuries, have been getting worse. <clears throat> and they act as if they have nothing to learn from history, which is the teacher of life. And as if at the, the time of past councils, Everything went favorably and correctly with respect to Christian doctrine, morality, and the church proper freedom. We believe we must disagree with these prophets of doom who are always forecasting disaster as if the end of the world were at hand. End quote. What's interesting here is not just his criticism of the prophets of doom, that has been explored a lot. But he said Pope John here used the concept of, of history as historia magistra vitae, uh, which comes from Cicero. By appealing to the historia magistra vitae, history, the teacher of life, Pope John, who had been trained as an historian by formation and especially an historian of the post council of Trent, made a case for the council that he had called unexpectedly, and he made that case based on the assumption that in the church, every moment of reform has always been a new appropriation of tradition, of recovery, of ressourcement, of rediscovery of the past, a past that is good. It was a time when the role of history was driven by the belief that civilization is important and that acquaintance with the, the past specifically of Western Christianity, of the Near East, of the Christian East, but also the classics, or 
Rome, Athens, could illuminate an individual and the community's life, bringing inspiration and self-understanding and making them, making us, better persons, better Christians, better citizens. Now, Historia Magistra Vitae was part of the theology of the Historia Salutis, of the history of salvation, of esoteriology. It was a sense of time that came from ancient Rome and not just survived Rome, but even contributed to the Renaissance. The, the past had value, and there was a distinction to make between a past with value, the classics up to uh, Christianity, and the past without value, the barbarians. The past of Rome was, in Catholic culture, essential. A past as example which has authority for a renovatio as a new beginning. And Rome, unlike Athens, was not just an ideal place, was a real place, papal Rome. It was a real place to look to, to go to, still today. During the French Revolution, Rome becomes the last refuge of humanity, or I perceive like that, against the new doctrines. Rome was a real place in ways both effective and symbolical where Europe has created its notion of cultural, artistic, and spiritual patrimony. <clears throat> On the horizon, there was Jesus Christ, and it was the Jesus Christ transmitted by the church. But that paradigm of the Historia Magistra Vitae, examples of the past, that inspire and guide was shattered already a first time by the German idea in the late 18th century of Geschichte, where the event is central and unique as a rapture, if we want, and there's no repetition of that event. A few days later, a few years later, the French revolution confirmed that idea of history. It was a new regime of, of historicity, and the old one, a more continuous regime, was dead. The past was no longer prediction of the future. Modernity was a tabula rasa, a clean slate. The present operates without a constitutive past. The real lessons started to come not from the past, but from the future. With this modern regime, the examples of the past were displaced, to say the least, or as Artog uh, put it, uh, quote, le passé est par principe ou par position de passé. The past passed away. After the revolution of the 19th and 20th century, Catholicism dealt with this change in the regime of, of, of historicity, also through the, the trauma of dealing with modernism in, in the early 20th century. But in those decades of the 20th century leading to Vatican II, there was a growth in the understandings of God's revelation, of the, of the liturgy, the church structure, and relations with the world, and other churches, and other religions, in a way that showed a growing cultural embeddedness within this idea of the tradition of the church of human agency. Faith is intimately related to the impact that historical consciousness had on the Council. And John O'Malley noted in his uh, famous book of 2008 that Vatican II was more historically conscious than any previous council, attempting to, 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 to treat religion in its historical dimension with as much earnestness as had traditionally been applied to its metaphysical dimension. It's this shift from a theology based on metaphysics to a theology based on a historical understanding of development. But Vatican II dealt with this 
rapture from the old Christian regime of historicity in a humanistic way that was founded exactly also still on the Historia Magistra Vitae, on the history as a teacher of life. At Vatican II, the Catholic past still had something to teach, both for ressourcement and for aggiornamento of theologians. The most uncomfortable chapters of our past were supposed to be left behind and forgotten, like, for example, in Nostra Etate, paragraph 3, on the relations between Christians and Muslims, or these uncomfortable passages were dealt with an implicit, silent way, like Nostra Etate, again, chapter 4, on anti-Semitism and the silence, for example, on theological anti-Judaism. Now, we cannot get away that easily today. We are under more pressure. We are in a different situation today. The main problem in understanding the role and voice of Vatican II in the church of today is how to interpret the council and its teaching as part of the tradition in a regime of historicity that at the time of Vatican II was already weakened and now is, I believe, in tatters. The ongoing polycrisis in the Catholic Church, in the context of the globalization of the Church, has showed us in a definitive way, I think, that the principle historia magistra vitae, history, the teaching of life, does not operate in the Church anymore. Not when the past tends to be identified fairly, unfairly, with systems of oppression, of subjugation. On the contrary, I think that now, if there's a, an Historia Magistra Vitae principle that is still operating, it tends to operate, especially in our context, often in a negative way, something like burn it all down. There's nothing to learn from our past. This disruption of the sense of history and tradition is evident, is more evident in Europe and in the West uh, in the context of, of the reassessment of the past of colonialism in the post-colonial global church. But what is typical in our context of the so-called cultural wars in which religion plays a central role means that we are more tempted than elsewhere to relate with our past ideologically, to serve one specific cause and function as the definitive argument in partisan political or, or ecclesial battles for which academia serves as a stage. This use of the past tends to see history as a call to situate oneself on the right side of history. And this is, I believe, a formidable challenge against the genuine, I, I would say, Catholic effort to engage with the church's past in order to see something of the church's future. This temptation to read history in reaction to immediate political, mediatic concerns affects the, the church's relationship with its tradition and with, and with Vatican II we still have to approach the texts of our theological tradition trying to avoid either distorting or ignoring patronizing in a correct hermeneutics that presupposes the knowledge of the historical context in which those texts were drafted and discussed and amended and approved and so on. But what we have seen in recent years, I think, is a deep crisis, especially in the Anglo-American world, in the historical consciousness of Vatican II, with divided memories taking over the history of Vatican II. The historiography of the event, what happened there, and the theological commentaries, what is the theological message of these documents and of that event, have been substituted largely by a different kind of effort. And, and by other voices. But at the origin, there's something that was a, a, a problem even before the 21st century. It's something that starts in the 
80s, 90s. On the one side, there was the memorialization and monu monumentalization of Vatican II as the effort to neutralize the discontinuities as co and continuities as the sentimentality of the veterans, we who were there, as a page from the civil religion book in the theological political narratives of the post-World War II in our Western world. In this form, Catholic narratives on the church and on Vatican II run the risk of fragmenting in incredibly small pieces, knowledge and social life of our lived church in a series of incommunicable points of view in which each group is walled within its own relationship with the world. As Italian historian Enzo Traverso has noted, in this kind of contemporary historiography, the we, any we, tends to dissolve. There is only the individual alone, and before the, the individual, omnipotent, there's only the ramified structure of the technoscience. And so there's a solitude that becomes all the more definitive as it also extends into the past. There's no collective sense that we were there together. Memory is just for the new economy of the identity of me of one. Memory is an instrument for, for presentism, for, for the advertising of my own identity, myself right now. This has to do with the autobiographical turn in Catholic historiography, which is affecting, I think, the Catholic ability to reflect on the past. On the other side, there are the naive attempts to blame secularization and dechristianization on Vatican II as the efficient cause of the, of the decline. But the hermeneutical battle following the 2005 speech of Pope Benedict XVI had, among it many effects, and some of them were unexpected, not just a revival of apologetics, but in some cases, unfortunately, a real damnatio, a condemnation of Vatican II and its effects in an, in an acceptance of a traditionalist narrative on the council, which was paradoxically one of the polemical targets of Pope Benedict's speech itself. So for those who deal with the past of the church, all of us, sometimes the, the, the options seem to be dramatically narrow. An apologetical defense of the past as immune from any deviation, a criminological approach to the past as the black legend of the church, working just for a posthumous rehabilitation of the Christian past when the church is dead. We have a shared past, but we do not have a shared memory and not a shared historical sense of the Second Vatican Council. And this is, I believe, a theological problem, an ecclesial problem, because history and memory are part of the making of the tradition and of the keeping of the tradition. So here, I think we have to face the problem of our temptation of a damnatio, of a condemnation of the past, which is, I think, a dead end. It's hard now to see where there is a common sense of destiny today in the Catholic Church, in its sense of history and of where we are going. And this has affected Vatican II itself. Still in the early 2000s, Vatican II was still called by some the forgotten future of the Church. There is a different sense in the church of today about Vatican II as having a, a place in the future of the church. It's the 21st century Catholic version of the end of the tyranny of future, a very weak sense of the future, a very opaque sense of the future, which has given us a very opaque sense of what is our tradition and also the Second Vatican Council. But there's something more, I think. Today, the past of the church 
both the distant past and the recent past, including Vatican II, seems to be symbolically almost on the stand as a defendant. And the future of the church, our future, seems to be already prime suspect, a possible cultural criminal in the making. And on the stand, on the, on, on the defendants, there is symbolically also the, the Second Vatican Council, which was unthinkable until I, I, a few years ago, I think. So the problem is bigger than a lost sense of, of, of the tradition in Catholicism, where the past used to be transmitted as the tradition, and being transmitted like that, it possessed authority almost automatically. Insofar as authority presented e itself historically as coming from the past, it could become tradition. Now we are in, in a different place. Now we, there's more than the usual reticence of Catholics to think dynamically about our history and our past. So here I believe we are faced with this challenge, which is a problem of intellectual and cultural and even spiritual su sustainability of this lost sense of where is our tradition and how defensible that is. The polycrisis has produced a very hard to, to reverse disenchantment, if not in some quarters even contempt of rage with the, the church's teaching. And the church, not just the pope or the Vatican or the, the bishops, but Catholics generally, I think are struggling to find their, their footing, their place in this very shaken sense of history. It's also, I'm not revealing anything, an emotional struggle. In some circumstances, in some moments, in some places, this sense of a dark past that is chasing us has created a climate of suspicion Against, genu against the possibility of genuine relationships in the, in the church, against the possibility of spiritual direction and of close contacts between members of the, of the church. This has instilled anxieties about what our church leaders and fellow Catholics, but also neighbors, co-workers, family members could have done in the past or could do to talk about movies, it feels sometimes closer to the lives of others on East Germany under communism than Babette's Feast. That has shaken me a lot, personally, honestly. So Vatican II is often seen as a failed revolution, uh, a, failed, a failed promise of reform. I believe this is a wrong assessment, this is uh, a dangerous assessment, but we need to recognize that we find ourselves in a situation where we cannot pretend that the narratives of Vatican II of the 1980s, of the 1990s, can be used with the same effect. We come from, from, from a post-Vatican II that found one of its expressions in a message of liberation, but now we seem to find ourselves in a despairing theology of victimization from which the church would need to emancipate itself. The result of this is a process of de-theologization of the church's thinking and a certain stagnation in the creative reflection on Vatican II is part of this, of this Catholic moment. Now, uh, approaching the conclusions, what to do with Vatican II in the Catholic tradition? What are the remains of the most important event in the Catholic Church in the last five centuries? Has Vatican II still something to say? I think it does. Absolutely. 
So certainly there is a problem of preservation and of defense. At least the, the defense of the idea of the theological and, and, and intellectual uh, tradition against a rising anti-intellectualism and detheologization. Denying that the Catholic Poly crisis affects our relationship with our past would signal, I think, a dangerous imperviousness to the signs of our times. This moment poses serious questions to the doctrinal order set by Vatican II, but also challenges the reformulation of the relations between church and state, the, the role of our church in culture, in our society, in our schools and universities. It's a challenge for all Catholics, no matter their ideological or theological positioning towards Vatican II. There are clear limits in the teaching of Vatican II and in the way they were implemented that must be subject to scrutiny. And addressing those limits must be, and I would say is already part of what the church is doing. This is one of the unstated, but I think very evident, assumptions driven synodality. It's the end of the idea that the church stopped its process of reform at and with Vatican II. So clearly, I think we have entered the, the new phase, not just in the reception of the, of the council, but also in the history of its perceived authority, both within the church and outside. I think, ultimately, that dealing with this crisis from a theological and religious point of view will require an extremely delicate operation, intellectually and ecclesially. But what I want to say here, and here in this place especially, is that there is there are reasons to caution against an historical theological narrative that absolutizes the, the, the crisis, the sinful moment in the life of the church, and to treat the church as a criminal phenomenon. Because the result of this is a Christian path, a Christian past, uh, a past as a pantheon of terror, which makes oppression inevitable and history irredeemable. Here we see the perverse effects of our system of social communication, boosted by digital and social media. Starting from the premise that the knowledge of the tragedies of our past constitutes a fundamental element of public pedagogy, the reading of history and of church history as a succession of catastrophes compresses what is instead, above all, a minimally viable sense of our living together as a church, but also as a civil and as a political community. There are serious risks if our approach to church history becomes a reversal of the history of salvation and takes instead the shape of history of perdition. And at the, uh, at the same time, history becomes a tribunal where the ultimate judgment uh, doesn't come from God, but from historians or journalists. This would devoid the story of the human person, not just Catholics or Christians, it would devoid the story of the human person of meaning and would paralyze any fight for justice and peace, included our quest for the, for the divine, for the God who, as the Constitution Dei Verbum of Vatican II says in the, in the second paragraph, quote, God who is invisible in his great love speaks to humankind as friends and enters into their life so as to invite and receive them into relationship. We must consider the sense of powerlessness entailed in the historical determinism of seeing the history of the church exclusively in terms of a 
sinful past of a black past. And so Christian action, or also our action for justice and truth, includes also intellectual and theological work, spiritual di uh, discernment, pastoral care. This requires a minimum of shared meanings about our past. The theological and historiographical question to address in the next future, I think, is whether Vatican II is still generative for the future of the church and of humanity, provided that we avoid a Vatican II fundamentalism and see it open to further developments and rethinking. I think that the, the council is still generative and essential in the Catholic tradition despite its, its limits uh, and its historical faults. An historically and theologically complete understanding of the tradition requires taking seriously the crisis with which I opened my remarks. There is an undeniable history and difficult present. But if we were to say that the church is, irrede is irredeemable, and cannot change, then we leave behind not just our sense of the church, but we leave behind also our humanity. In other words, all these reflections on the Second Vatican Council and on our past is very relevant, I think, because it's a powerful reminder that it's important to know, to learn to know, how to love the church that already exists here, and not just the one that will come, or the church that once was. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Dr. Fajoli. I do believe that we have time for questions. And uh, Jillian over there has a microphone. If you'd please uh, raise your hand and we can get a question. Dr. Fagioli, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm Deacon Tim Berryhill of the Archdiocese of Chicago. Uh, just a couple minutes ago, you had mentioned um, the necessity of a, mi a minimum of shared meetings. Uh, I'm sure that's a very lengthy list, but I was wondering if you could elucidate um, what maybe in your view are some of the absolute like fundamental shared meanings of past, of tradition, and, and specifically of, of Vatican II. Thank you. So thank you for your question. So. I believe that the first thing is that the Second Vatican Council is part of the, of the tradition of the church, was not a deviation, was not a mistake, was not a happening of, of some people who had strange ideas. So that's the, the first. And I believe that the most important thing is that it was an historical event which we should look at um, as part of the Holy Spirit working in the church. So there's something that is not measurable, that shouldn't be measured. Uh, it, that's not, not everything is recordable. It, there's no evidential exhibits that we can say to a, in, in, in a court, right? So that is, it's, it's a matter of faith in the church that gave us Vatican II. Because if we start by saying, well, Vatican II was not a real council, was, I'm not sure what kind of ecclesiology there is there. I mean, what kind of sense of the church there is there. And so that is the very minimum, I would say. Uh, that's part of, of, of a living tradition. Uh, and the two parts are important. I mean, living is important, and tradition is important, <laughs> right? So we tend sometimes to focus only on the living, on the changes, or to focus only on the big T tradition. That doesn't change, right? So that's, uh, so I think that we are forced now to get back to our desk uh, to, to, uh, to our catechesis and to make this argument because there's no longer a generation 
of grandparents or of priests, of bishops who were there, who lived there. So this is a very important element. I'm, to give you a, a comparison, it's a little similar to what happened in the tradition on, on the Holocaust, on, on the Shoah. I mean, once those witnesses are not there, you have to I mean, realize that something has changed, right? And so this is what I would say. And then there's the I mean, documents of the Second Lateran Council, um, but the very minimum comes even before. It's an act of trust of faith in the church that gave us Vatican II. This is, is taken sometimes as obvious. It's not obvious, uh, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Michael Frankevich. I'm a seminarian for the Archdiocese of Chicago. Just if I may try to rearticulate the thesis of your presentation, and if you could confirm or correct my own uh, understanding or misunderstanding. The central part of it is that the human person or the understanding of the self is based on memory, which is extended not only in our individual lives, but in our common history. And so that if there is something that has shattered the church's way of understanding history, our previous paradigm, that that ultimately is going to cause a fracturing of the common memory of the church and then of the common understanding of each individual themselves. And so as a result, we need to return, not necessarily return, but perhaps even recreate a historical paradigm that is not swayed by modernist interpretations of history but nor is perhaps as naive uh, as a paradigm of history used in the early church as well, but one that reconciles and is able to handle great shocks such as Marxism, uh, such as the various deep scandals that plague our church. Do I have the right sense of your thesis? You paraphrased masterfully what I was saying. So here yeah, there's something... So. I believe that we are in a postmodernist uh, frame here. And the postmodernist means, and this goes back to the 80s, but what's one means that the grand narratives are no longer working. Right? So the uh, I mean, progress or uh, development, it doesn't work anymore. Right? So, but what's different, I think, between the 80s? I mean, uh, 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 the Otar and the postmodernist, and now, is that now I think we have a more accentuated um, I church, I tradition, I Christianity, right? So it's everything is extremely individual focused, right? And so this is is very problematic because uh, the tradition is a we, it's not an I, it is us, right? And so here, the, the, so I think that we need to, to, to take seriously how the scandals and so on have affected our relationship with our past, but that is on the surface because there's something deeper that we no longer I mean, it, it has become more difficult for us to see ourselves as part of a collective, of any collective, including the church. And so, so this is bigger than any liberal traditionalist uh, quarrel, right? Because this affects both sides, I think, right? So this is deeper. It, it goes to the heart of what it means now to, uh, to relate to our dead giants, I mean, Delubac and Congar and so on, but also to our people that are in church with us and so on. So that, I mean, if we have a broken relationship with our past of our church, it's likely that your relationships are broken also with your fellow parishioners, right? So this is all with the Pope, 
and I'm not opening this chapter here, right? <laughs> so that's so it's a it's a problem that affects all of those who work on Vatican II, but all of those who care for the tradition which has continued to I mean evolve after Vatican II. And I I think that the so there's an essential component in 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 restoring this sense of connection, which is uh, being in touch with the real church, which is a problem. It, it, it's a professional disease for academics, uh, but not only, right? And so it's easier to reconnect with a correct sense of the past of the church if you're able to love the the church that there is now, with all its faults, all its, okay, but you want to love this church that there is now, not the church of 1965, or the church of 1865, or of, of 2265, right? So it's not just intellectual, it's also spiritual. It, it's, um, I've discovered this aging with kids, with, uh, so they, it, uh, we cannot say Vatican II, so we cannot tell that story in the same way we did 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, it, it, it's not, uh, so that has practical implications for those who preach, those who, who, who teach. Uh, it's not abstract only. Yeah. Thank you. That's, I, I should have recorded what you said. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tracy from Chicago. I'm a regular parishioner. I'm a leader in my church. I'm a teacher, healthcare person. From what you're talking about, who's in place now in the leadership of the church? Or, you know, what's in place? Who's in place now for regular parishioners who care about the future of the church? So that we are from where we are now to our next steps. So I Can think you talk that. Talk about that. Thank you. So. I believe that the synodal process and synodality is Pope Francis' way to call us to, I mean, out of our niche and to think about what it means to be church and to think about how the, the tradition um, is, what it's telling us of these last decades what needs to be augmented of the Second Vatican Council that wasn't there 60 years. So, I mean, thank God we have a visible church with a structure. I'm, a, I'm an institutionalist in this sense, so I do believe that we need to have a certain kind of rules, of structures, because they keep us in our freedom, right? So I'm suspicious when the discourse on, on the church is framed in terms of a dialectic between authority and freedom. I believe that's totally wrong. I mean, this is, uh, so I mean, I, I cherish my freedom, but I feel more free in, in a visible institution, right? So that's, so there are these, uh, these places, these voices. Now, your question is important, why? Because we, I mean, the most difficult thing now is to discern who are the real authorities. Okay, because out there, there's a, no, a, a myriad, a galaxy of different authorities, voices, and so on. This has become more, more difficult, right? Because once you knew that the Pope, your bishop, your parish priest, easy, <laughs> right? It's not like that now. And I don't think that we can go back identically to a 1950s thing. But there's a certain genius in saying, well, uh, that 
there's a parish, there's a community that is a visible leader, and so on. That is an instrument for spiritual freedom and growth and liberation. So, but we have become accustomed, I think, with this, the idea that authority, hierarchy is essentially inimical, an enemy to human freedom. Maybe because I'm Italian, but I don't believe that. I mean, we have a, a, a weak sense of authority in Italy, maybe, right? So, but I think we need to get m more humble and say, I need to be catechized. I need to learn something, right? And this is a little lost, I think. Uh, in all of us, it's not the left or the right. It's the I world. But I would say. Thank you. Hi, thank you for gi giving me the opportunity to ask a question. I'm Bernie Hennings from Buffalo Grove, the parish of Buffalo, uh, St. Mary's in Buffalo Grove. Um, I heard the word crisis several times, and I'm trying to determine: is there one? Is it one crisis? Is it multiple crises? Is there, is there one crisis that's more serious than the other or, or elevated or important? Can you elaborate on the crisis without repeating your entire... I am sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so two things. Uh, the word crisis has a very important role in this thesis by this historian, French historian Francois Artaud, who, who, who says crisis the K, is a key term in the Christian regime of historicity because it has to do with God speaking in critical moments, right? So I'm not going into that. Okay. Now, I think that now we are in our time in what some uh, scholars have called the poly crisis. So there is the environmental crisis, the crisis of democracies, the crisis of debt. I mean, countries drowning in debt like never before. Right? So there is a sense of that a moment of reckoning will come because we have lived foolishly for too long. We have ignored some challenges. Right? So uh, things are piling up right now. And so as an historian, that reminds me and I don't want to send a, a scary message, but I mean, what some Catholic intellectuals were saying in the 1930s, they said, well, the, our civilization is broken, it's not working here, right? So I mean that. So that, I mean, we can say, why is the, the Catholic Church in the world the most investigated institution when it's about some kind of I mean, it can be persecution, it can be in some countries and so on. But I think it's important because when something happens in the church, it's visible in ways that you don't see in a secular state. You don't see in a corporation, in a firm. So the church has always been part of the organizing of our world not just politically, socially, but also, I mean, sacramentally, what we give value to, I mean, rights, gestures, right? So we, I believe that as Catholics and as a church, as a scholar, I believe it's important to understand the Catholic crisis, to understand the state of our world, right? That's, that's how I approach uh, it's not as, a, as a, an automatic uh, lawyer for, the, for the, uh, the church, but as a member who wants to uh, contribute, but also as a citizen of this world or as I say. So where if you get what's happening in the Catholic Church to vulnerable people, to minors, to that, you get what's happening 
with that same problem outside of, of, of the church. That's, that's what I've learned. Right. So, I mean, crisis is a, it's a word that, I mean, there's an inflation of the, of the use of crisis, and I apologize if I use that too often. But, uh, but this is, is where we are, I think. I mean, I'm not sure how many people now can get away easily with the, the idea, everything will be fine, don't worry. Right, so... So there's anxiety of different kinds in many different quarters. We're no longer in the 80s, in the 90s, where everything will be bigger, smarter, richer. And there are limits. Right? That's, that's what, uh, what I, I was hinting at. Uh, okay, maybe one more question. Hi, thank you for coming. Deacon Matthew Cook, uh, Diocese of Wichita, Kansas. You'd mentioned multiple times throughout the talk a idealization of both the past and then a hypothetical future. Uh, do you see a, a, a reason why there's such a tendency to do that, to idealize? Um, why is that a tendency either for the left or for the right to idealize certain things? Yeah, that's an important question. So we tend to reduce that to the idea that we select from our past something that we like, and we present that to our enemies or friends and so on. This is me, OK? That happens, OK? But there's something worse there in this sense, that if we start selecting from our tradition what went right, and, and we cut out what went wrong, it's, it's like, so it tends to feed a fundamentalist approach to the past. The past will never be made only of things that you like, that make you feel comfortable. So we have to share as a church as a nation, as an ethnicity, that he, our past is complicated, that the past of every nation is complicated, of every ethnicity is complicated. Okay? And not just because it's simpler, because it's, it's, it's more honest, but because if you start excising, eliminating those chapters that are sinful, you will you will construct a past that you will, you will totally identify with in, in a fundamentalist way. In an analogy, it's just like taking scripture, okay, the Bible, and you keep in scripture only those passages that don't offend anyone, that make you feel good, make you feel... Okay, that's not just disingenuous, okay, but you will read that Bible that remains those few pages in a fundamentalist way, which is a very un Catholic way of reading texts, of reading history. So, here I think that the, the temptation of sanitizing our past, of tearing down some moments. It has some kind of, of intent that I can share. But the result will be to make people less open to the fact that we will continue to make mistakes. <laughs> so we will continue to do bad things. And we will see ourselves as the good people that, will, that can only write the good pages in the book of history. In the, good, in the book of the Bible. That's very dangerous, right? So that's, I mean, history as such should be taken, in, not integrally because that echoes, but as it is, and make, and make assessments and be honest, but not with a damnation of entire chapters because it's a self 
absolutory move, which I find dangerous at the personal level, as a collective level, as a church, as a country. As it, it's not the way to correct our past, I think. So again, we thank you all for coming out here this evening and for listening to our 2024 20, Pollock lecturer. Many thanks to uh, Mary Lou Pollock and the wisdom of her family and parents who established this more than 30 years ago. And you'll be able to read uh, this lecture in the uh, future edition of Chicago Studies Journal, which is the journal of the University of St. Mary the Lake. And this was recorded and we'll have it available online uh, in the next week or so. So many thanks again. Thank you to our speaker, Dr. Fajoli. Thank you for being here. Good night.